well to when it's safe to travel easily again to travel to do some night sky or even daytime sky observing. Yeah. So with that, we are going to be moving forward into the program. Uh, but real quick, before we do that, I do want to say a quick thank you to our support team here who is uh, helping Mary and I. Uh, Stefan is running the technic for us along with Han and Florian. And uh, my colleague Jana is going to be taking your questions. So please, if you have questions, shoot them out in the chat. Mary and I love answering questions uh, and we will get to those at the end, but type them out as you think about them so you don't forget them. Shoot them on over and Jana will make sure that we get those. So with that, let's go ahead and take you out into space and give you, give you a, I guess it wouldn't be a bird's eye view really of where Mary and I are since uh, <laughs> we would be outside of the atmosphere. So there you see our beautiful planet Earth. And as I mentioned, I am located in Berlin. And I'm over in, well, technically right now in Alameda, but I'm over in San Francisco in the Bay Area. And that's why this is Berlin to the Bay. <laughs> So that's Indeed. where the bay comes from, yeah. if any of you weren't certain about that. And your background gets to be super cool because you're in your planetarium right now. I'm in my room, so it's a little less cool. <laughs> yes, but you've already reopened. You you are getting to actually spend time with visitors again in person, which is super exciting. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to us being able to do that again soon. And yeah, it's been really being able nice. to share. Yeah, but it's yeah. great that we can share space from anywhere in the world, really. The mm -hmm. As we've been saying here, the universe is always open. So that's, <laughs> nice. that's, that's one of the nice things about our job. But uh, yes, so, so this is Berlin. Um, as you can see, we are heading in tonight. So that's a little bit further this evening because uh, fortunately, it's my favorite time of year where it stays light out for a long time. Actually, it's a conflicting time of year for me because I love night. I love night sky viewing and observing. But I also love that here in Berlin, it stays light out until like 10 p.m. in the summer, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, it's a little more difficult in the winter sometimes just because it starts getting dark around 3 p.m. So Oof. that's yeah, it's a it's a really big difference from where you are, isn't it, Mary? Yeah, I think in the winter at the earliest, it gets dark around like five, I want to say something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely what I was used to before I moved here. So the first winter I spent here, it was definitely a shock, which goes to show wherever you are in the world, you may not even experience the same amounts of daylight. So mm -hmm. that's something we'll look at in a little bit. But as you can see right now in Berlin, it is or a little bit later than now. It will be dark out and you can see all of that lovely, beautiful glow of the lights from space. And this is something you see lots of pictures of that the astronauts like to take a look at. And we're zooming in now to Berlin as seen from space. And you can see a ton of lights. So here in Berlin, unfortunately, we have a huge problem with light pollutions like most major cities do. It is hard to see the stars here at night. One of the cool things though about this picture is you can actually still see the division from where the wall was. So, um, Mary, you, maybe you can notice that some of the lights on the right side of the image at least look uh, a little mm -hmm. more of a, a wider bluish yeah, kind of light. Top, top right and then like bottom left kind of, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then over on, or excuse me, the left side, I meant the left side was the bluish light, but oh, you can yeah, see the division. Yeah. There we mm -hmm. go. There yeah. we go. Now it's a little easier. Uh, so yeah, on the on the left side of the image, we have the more bluish white light. And on the right side of the image is that that uh, little bit more softer, warmer light. Uh, and so the right side of the image, that is former East Berlin. And we're still using, I'm actually in former East Berlin right now. That's where the Zeiss Coast Planetarium is. Uh, our, one of our other planetariums, the Planetarium Amin Solana is over in the West where you see the brighter white lights. Uh, and so we're still using different types of light bulbs in both sides of the city. And slowly it's starting to integrate between the two. And you can see a little of that over in the East. There's some of the brighter, uh, colder style lights that you see in the mm -hmm. West. They're starting to be over in the the east now too but it's interesting that you can actually, still see that yeah do you happen to know which one is better for stargazing like is one a one type makes it easier to see the sky or not i i know that the led bulbs make it really difficult uh and and they're more confusing too for 
insects and animals that rely on the circadian rhythm, their natural circadian rhythm for mating, uh, for babies being born, for example, that's a huge problem for sea turtles. In the areas where sea turtles live, um, the babies can be distracted even more easily by the LED lights, and then they don't go necessarily the right direction to the water because they're not getting the glow of the moon. Mm -hmm. to guide them, they're being directed towards the LEDs. So um, anything that's going to be not as bright. Right. And also with red lights making things easier to see at night um, when you're stargazing, like we, I know we've gone stargazing together. We, we always have uh, the red covered flashlights and that's because the red helps prevent loss of night vision. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Definitely the warmer light, I think, is more helpful. But yeah, makes sense. it's not all that much easier to see anything in San Francisco, is it? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> I'd imagine not. Yeah. Are we going to fly? I think we're going to fly over to San Francisco now. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to time travel again. So right now in San Francisco, it's about, what, 9 a.m., a little bit after 9 a.m. So we're going to go forward in time to tonight. And we've also got a picture of San Francisco. And one of the, uh, in, well, first of all, in the lights you can see, uh, there's less lights in the West, but in California, there's quite a few uh, lights as well. And in this picture, something that's uh, unfortunate in a way, but also kind of cool is that you can really see this like dome of light. So when the light goes up into the sky, not only um, do the lights around you in this immediate area can affect uh, even things like safety and stuff, depending on the types of lights that you're using. Um, but also when you're doing stargazing, it's not just the immediate lights around you because that light goes up into the atmosphere and creates this kind of sky glow. So you do see that very clearly um, in this picture here. But I think kind of similar to how, Anna, you were saying how summertime is your favorite time of year, but it's kind of conflicting because then you don't get to do as much stargazing. I think city lights are really pretty. So <laughs> while I definitely prefer to be able to see uh, the night sky. And I want us to get a lot of uh, lights that will help us do that better and also make everything like safety and stuff for humans better. I do uh, think it's very, very pretty when the city is lit up at night. Yeah, I hate to admit that I think the same thing. And I actually caught myself <laughs> the other day going riding the train through Berlin and thinking, oh, I love this city so much. It's so pretty, especially at night. And then I felt like the world's biggest traitor for thinking that. <laughs> Yeah, I've definitely had those same thoughts for sure. Yeah. So, but one of the nice things, at least, about being in the planetarium mm -hmm. or live streaming out of the planetarium is that we can take away light pollution from anywhere in the world. So we can share the night sky with you from Berlin, from San Francisco, as if there were no city lights. And so that's what we're going to do right now with you. We're going to start from Berlin, since it's already getting towards nighttime here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're gonna take a look at the springtime constellations that we have. So this is pretty much how we see Berlin now. Now it's starting to get a little generous. Uh, so we see maybe 200 stars, 250 stars here in Berlin, uh, which, which honestly is a lot more than I, I was expecting when I first moved here. But, um, the human eye can take in the light of about 9,000 stars. So that tells you, yeah, that tells you how, how little we see here in the city. But now what we're seeing is a non-light polluted sky. So this is much prettier. And mm -hmm. like I said, I wanna, I wanna take us through the springtime constellations because we are still technically in the season of spring until next month. Middle of next month is our summer solstice. So what you're seeing here now is the summer triangle or excuse me, the spring triangle. Didn't mean to mow your lawn there, Mary. Don't worry. <laughs> Mary will be getting to the summer triangle in a little bit. So this is our spring triangle. Uh, sometimes it's also known as the spring diamond and they added another star, it just depends. So the, the spring triangle is an asterism. So an asterism is not a constellation, but it is a pattern of stars. And what is the difference between a constellation, which is a pattern of stars and an asterism that's a pattern of stars? Well, one is quote unquote official and the other one is not. So there are 88 official constellations that we share between the Northern and Southern hemispheres. And anything that's not one of those official 88 
as dictated by the International Astronomical Union or the IAU, who, for lack of a better way to phrase it, basically makes the laws and rules regarding uh, what we recognize in astronomy. So for example, they're also the ones that decided that uh, Pluto and Ceres should be dwarf planets. Yeah, so don't they, come they, when you're upset about Pluto, it's not our fault. <laughs> also, also it happened 15 years ago this year. Yeah, uh, yeah. so we've had, we've had the grieving time regarding Pluto. So also it's not alive, it doesn't have hard feelings about it. So, but it's still cool. yeah, and it's definitely still cool. Uh, but also asterisms are pretty cool, even if they're not quote unquote official, because you can create your own. You can create as many as you like. If you see a pattern of stars in the sky, that can be your very own asterism. Uh, asterisms like the summer triangle, the spring triangle, the spring diamond, which, whichever one you prefer to see, um, they are all typically recognized throughout uh, the world by amateur astronomers to help them find things. And one of the cool things too about the seasonal shape asterisms is that they are connected to official constellations. So we see an example of that with our spring triangle here. There are three different springtime constellations attached to it. So we're gonna make those a little easier for you to see. There we go. So uh, the one that kind of looks like a kite is Boote's the Herdsman. And then we also have uh, below that, we have uh, Virgo, Maiden of the Harvest. And then the thing that kind of looks a little bit like a backwards question mark or a coat hanger is Leo the Lion. Now, if you go all the way to the top, you'll see uh, what here in Germany we call the Große Wagen, the large cart, um, which definitely looks like that. You have to imagine some wheels on the bottom of it, but I, I definitely see a cart up there. Uh, of course, in the United States, we know that as the Big, the Dipper. Big Dipper. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, and the Big Dipper is our guide to the springtime sky. So if we start with the Big Dipper, uh, you can use the front two stars of the bowl. So uh, if we go towards the front part of the bowl and the uh, away from the handle, uh, those two front stars point down to Leo the lion. Um, and then if we, there we go. Yep. And if we use the handle, those stars make a curve or an arc. We're going to call it an arc because they help us arc to Arcturus. So Arcturus is the star there. That is the knee of Bote's the herdsman. And once you have arced to Arcturus, don't stop. Speed south to Spica. Uh huh. That's right, Mary. I said speed self. No, nope, you speed self. It's spike to Spica. Don't let her lie to you. <laughs> oh no, we speed south to Spica. There's a big so, uh, argument, ongoing argument until the end of time among planetarium people. Is it speed to Spica or is it spike to Spica? I'm a spike. You are a speed. But we are still friends, so you know. This is this is true, <laughs> even though you are wrong. This is true. Mm -hmm. So, yes, yes. These are in case you've ever wondered. These are the things that planetarium nerds fight about uh <laughs> what is the best way to describe how to find <laughs> constellations and use alliteration to do so Indeed. so but yes yes even though we have our differences we are definitely still friends Indeed. <laughs> so spica is the wheat in the arms of virgo maiden of the harvest uh now the big dipper up there i'm not going to go too much into the big dipper at the moment because i know you're going to talk a little bit about that mary Mm -hmm. um, but the Big Dipper is, or the Gulsavagen, is uh, part of another constellation of the Big Bear. And uh, we get to see that all year, so, which is pretty cool here. I, I didn't get to experience that until moving here. So I'm originally from a latitude actually closer to where you are, Mary. I'm originally from St. Louis, and that's uh, 38.6 degrees northern latitude. And now here in Berlin, I'm at 52.6. So that, that was a much bigger difference than I was expecting but in St. Louis, the bear sets. Here in Berlin, the bear is out all year long. So now I realize these six figures that we're showing you are probably not helping you visualize a herdsman or particularly a maiden of the harvest. 
maybe the lion you can see. Okay, we'll give we'll give Leo his due that he actually does kind of look like a lion. But mm -hmm. um, Stefan, could you help us to see what these constellations should look like? There we go. Much better. That's totally what you were all imagining at home. I know. Of course. Yeah. Uh, but yes, so that helps us see a little bit better. And, and keep in mind, um, at least in Western culture, we get most of the constellations that we recognize in the Northern Hemisphere from the ancient Greeks, Greco-Roman tradition. And so these come from those myths that you may have heard. And that's why we have, have these particular constellations like Virgo and Bootes. But I see a little bit different of a sky like Mary. We touched on that already a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. but some of it's the same. So yeah. Mary, why don't you show us what the sky looks like for you in San Francisco a little bit later in the evening, maybe? Yeah, so we're gonna fly over to San Francisco now. And uh, how you were talking about the big difference in the latitude from where you are now and where you were in St. Louis. Uh, I even noticed a difference. I used to live in Michigan and uh, when I first started doing a lot of planetarium shows and stuff, it was from Ann Arbor, which was a latitude of, if I'm remembering correctly, it was 42.27 degrees. Um, and here in San Francisco, it's about 37 degrees. So even that change of like five degrees though, I noticed a difference because when we would do stargazing, I would go to look for the Big Dipper. Um, it would be a little harder in the summertime to be able to find it because it is so low in the sky. I didn't think about that that in uh, like in Michigan, the bear kind of skirts along the horizon and here it kind of goes a little bit below the horizon. So uh, I rely a bit more on Cassiopeia here actually, if I'm trying to find okay. uh, those northern constellations at this point. But I believe, let's see, let me orient myself here. I think we're gonna start with the summer triangle because you talked about the spring constellation since we are still in spring, uh, but we're about to get close to summer. so. Uh, I believe it's June 20th is the first day of summer officially. So we'll, we're pretty close to that. Um, and right now in San Francisco, if you look towards the Northeast, um, pretty early in the night, you can see, start to see some summer constellations. So this is the summer triangle, the asterism that has a few bright stars uh, from some of the summer constellations that we have here. And I always look for this when it's actually summertime and if it's like midsummer, it's usually pretty high up in the sky and it's towards the South. So and all three of these stars are very bright, so it's very easy to find. And if you're somewhere really dark too, I'll make note that you can see in this uh, view here, since we have no light pollution, so you would not see this from San Francisco, but if you look where the triangle is, it's right in the middle of where the Milky Way is in the sky as well. So that can help you find the Milky Way if you're looking for that in the summer. But let's bring up our uh, asterisms or our lines for the constellations, the official ones. So the three summer uh, constellations are uh, often depicted as three birds, actually. So one of them, the smaller one on the top right there, that is Lyra the lyre, which is kind of like a harp, sort of. Um, and some of the depictions, it's being held by a bird. I don't know why. Uh, the top one on the left is uh, Cygnus the swan. And on the bottom is Aquila the eagle. And it's not part of the summer triangle, but I've requested that we include one of my favorite constellations as well, because this is one I always look for uh, in the summer, is the teeny tiny one on the left there, which is Delphinus the dolphin, one of the smallest constellations in the sky. And it's very cute because it's a dolphin. So that's one of my favorites. <laughs> and uh, I think those are a little easier to see, but still the pictures help a lot to be able to pick out what these are supposed to look like. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. And I know that um, another one that's really easy to find in the summer here, and I know that you're kind of sad you can't see as well, Anna, where you're at now is uh, Scorpius, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Scorpius. yeah, the first time I did a summertime show here, I went to go point it out because I was so used to it from back home. And I went, and here you can see, and I had to quick change direction of where I was going to point because <laughs> There was no scorpion to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and it's unfortunate too because it is one of the ones that's easiest to find. It's got this really distinct curve shape and a very bright red star called Antares, which not that long ago I learned means not Mars, basically, anti-Aries, yeah. <laughs> uh, because often people would confuse it with Mars because it is very red. Yes. Uh, 
But, and like you were saying, Anna, though, this is a good spot to point out that this is just one depiction of this constellation. There's tons of other uh, stories and depictions that people have around the world for these uh, constellations. So if you're in Hawaii, for an example, you might call this Maui's fish hook, for example. Yes, and that was definitely popularized thanks to Disney with yeah. <laughs> the movie Moana, or here in Germany it's called Viana. Um, but whichever version of the movie you watch, uh, you may recognize Maui and his hook. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, so that is uh, definitely something to look for, like you said, if you're a little bit further south. You, you can see the, the claws, the pictures here, but mm -hmm. that's, that's about that's it. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And we're now looking back over at the dippers again, because that's definitely something you can easily see a difference of if you were in Berlin versus here in San Francisco, uh, because the, another way that we can use the Big Dipper, we can use it to find not just the spring constellations, but if you go the other direction, then you can also find the Little Dipper, which you're seeing on the top right over there. And the handy thing about that is the tip of the handle of the Little Dipper is the North Star. And since the North Star is pretty much directly over the North Pole of the Earth, as the night goes by, all the other st stars appear to rotate around the North Star and the North Star does not move. It stays in the same spot. So it's a really good tool to navigate, to kind of orient yourself and navigate um, where you are in on the Earth and what you're seeing in the sky. Um, and the farther north you get or the farther south you get, that changes how high up in the sky the North Star would be. So uh, what's your latitude again, Anna, up there? It's uh, about 52.56. Yeah, so if you were in Berlin, the North Star would be 52.56 degrees above the horizon. If you were to go to the North Pole, it would be right overhead. And if you were to go to the equator, it would be right on the horizon. And so where I'm at, about 37 degrees, it would be 37 degrees above uh, the horizon. So it can really tell you where you are on the Earth. But something also very cool about planetariums is that we don't have to stay on Earth and we don't have to only look at the sky from Earth. We can go out into space and see what these depictions will look like there. Because if you go anywhere on the Earth, you're going to see the same set of patterns. So you see the Big Dipper, the bears that we're seeing here, which I think we're about to put up the pictures of the bears, the big bear and the little bear. And even if you go uh, to uh, the Southern Hemisphere, you're still gonna be able to see among that 88 constellations that we have and the other depictions of these uh, patterns of stars. But that's just what you see from here on Earth. If you were to go out into space at a certain point, if you get far enough out, it starts to look a little bit different. So we're now going to switch our view and fly away from Earth a little bit. Ooh. Ooh. If you get motion sick. <laughs> yeah, close your eyes if it makes you yeah. dizzy. <laughs> you can see San Francisco there as we're flying away. And the go over the cities around us. And one of my favorite things to do uh, with the constellation lines that we're able to use in the planetarium is to do this, is to fly away and see what those look like from space. So I actually, I feel like before I uh, worked in a planetarium, I would have probably assumed, I don't know if I even thought about it, but I probably would have assumed that if you went to another planet in our solar system, that you would not see the same constellations. You wouldn't see these patterns that you're seeing in the background right now. So I can see on the left there, I see Gemini. We're seeing Orion at the top there on his, on his side. So maybe like we're near the equator or something. But in a second, we're gonna zoom out and see how long it takes until these patterns start to look different. And the thing that I find surprising is that it takes a while. If you went to pretty much any of the other planets in our solar system, you would still see these same star patterns because these stars are not flat uh, patterns like we see from here on Earth. They are stars that are different distances and different uh, groups and stuff out there in our galaxy. So as we fly away and we see the sun looking teeny tiny now, our constellations start to look very strange because so they're cool. not those flat patterns that we see in the sky. So I like to imagine that if uh, you were on a planet around another star, an exoplanet, what kind of constellations would you see there? I don't know. It would be interesting to know too, like what, how, how those pa particular patterns of stars would compare. And I would imagine too, that 
any life on another planet outside of our solar system obviously would have creatures and and different objects that we've never even thought of or seen or heard of before uh, yeah, but it would be interesting for sure yeah. to see how they they would look at that completely differently yeah absolutely that'd be super cool unfortunately we haven't found any intelligent life out there yet we're looking though hopefully someday yes <laughs> yes uh but before we get too far out we're going to head back to our solar system for a little bit because we've got some really cool things that have just happened or are about to happen involving our own star. So we are going to keep our focus on the stars for now as we head back to our sun, our daytime star. And that's something, too, a lot of people don't really think of our sun as a star. It's very easy to forget. We call it sun, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so important to us here on Earth. It gives us life. It helps plants grow. It, it gives us vitamin D uh, or helps us make vitamin D rather. Uh, and yeah, it's easy to forget it's a star, but the sun is very much a star. And so here we're looking at um, Earth and Mercury and they were uh, in line with each other there. And, uh, but Mercury moves very quickly. So it's already gotten away from us. But uh, when Earth, Mercury and the sun were aligned with each other, that is what we call syzygy, S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y, syzygy. Uh, this is my favorite word. Uh, I learned it uh, when we were having the total solar eclipse in 2017 in the United States. And it is just one of the coolest words. And if you're a Scrabble player, I understand it's worth like 30 points. So good word to have if you have lots of whys. And uh, yeah, a syzygy is just the alignment of three celestial bodies. So it could be anything like the alignment of Earth and Mercury, which gave us a beautiful transit a couple years ago now, uh, at least that we got to see here in Berlin. And we have uh, an image of that transit from, thanks to NASA. And so this was uh, uh, an image that was stacked in the image, it's multiple images as Mercury transited or appeared to move across the face of the sun. And so that was thanks to the alignment of sun, Mercury, Earth our sun, Mercury, Earth, syzygy. So I understand that you had another type of syzygy very recently, Mary, and unfortunately mm -hmm. we didn't get to enjoy that syzygy here in Berlin. Indeed, yeah, just a couple of days ago on the 26th, we had a total lunar eclipse over here in uh, California. And this one was one that uh, you needed to be pretty far in the west if you were in the United States, or you needed to also be pretty far north, I think. So if you were uh, up in far north Canada, or uh, maybe even near the North Pole, I'm not totally sure about that. But we did have a total lunar eclipse. So this was a, syzy a syzygy uh, where the sun, the earth, and the moon were lined up and the earth cast a shadow on the moon. So as we go through this, I think we're going to get like a, a more zoomed out, uh, or is it already zoomed in to the moon a little bit? I know we're making we're getting there. Out. Yeah, we're making the moon yep. a little bit bigger so we can see it a bit more easily. But this is what it looked like at about 4 a.m. Uh, in San Francisco and in Alameda on the 26th. Now, I personally did not go out to watch this. It was 4 a.m. I was asleep. But if you ever have a chance to see a lunar eclipse, it is very, very cool. I have seen it a couple of times before. It is wonderful. And you can even tell in this image here, it got a little bit red when it was at the total lunar eclipse uh, part because of how things aligned and because of the Earth. So the only reason you hear about a blood moon um, that is a total lunar eclipse is what a blood moon is because the moon turns this kind of reddish color. And the reason for that is just our atmosphere. So a similar reason to why, oh, our Roomba is starting. Uh, I might go grab that in a second. But um, <laughs> uh, the reason that we uh, see red sunsets has to do with the light going through our atmosphere. And actually, I'll be right back. Give me one second. Sure thing. Pesky, pesky robot vacuum cleaners. Causing, oh, wow, that was in the other room, too. Uh, yes, so that's that's what happens in a pandemic. Pets, robot vacuums, they keep us on our toes. I always forget that it's on an automatic thing, so it starts at, I guess, 930. Oh, uh, you have a morning. really intelligent robot vacuum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, yes, the blood moon is just because it's a total lunar eclipse, 
And some of the light, there is a little bit of light that still gets to the moon, even though the moon has the shadow of the earth on it. But the light that did get to it has all gone through our atmosphere and only the red light is able to travel all the way through the atmosphere and the blue light gets left behind. And I think yeah. now we're flying back over to Berlin, right? Uh, we're gonna or take a look at light. your eclipse again one more time, but this oh, time from space. Ah, yes. So we're going to see what the syzygy looks like. I'm not used to saying that word like you are, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looks like from space. So we can see what it looks like when we have a lunar eclipse. So I did mention it was the sun, earth, and moon lining up. And as we zoom out, you can see the orbit of the moon. And again, we're going to make everything look a lot bigger so we can see it more easily. This, this does not actually happen when an eclipse happens. The earth does not swell up much larger. And if, you can it, see if it does, then we have a big problem. No problem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So off in the distance, you can see the sun and you can see how it's lined up perfectly with the earth and the moon. So anytime that happens, that is when we experience an eclipse. And the moon, we get a, a full moon, which is the phase you need to have a lunar eclipse. We get a full moon every month, but we do not get this lunar eclipse every month because things aren't lined up, per up perfectly. So if you look at the orbit of the moon, it's a little bit tilted uh, relative to where the earth and the sun are. So things have to line up just right so that everything is directly in a line and then you're able to get this effect of everything lining up perfectly and i believe we're going to look at the other way too uh well yes yes okay. we're gonna we're gonna get there yeah so <laughs> you got to have a lunar eclipse we get to have a solar eclipse here in Berlin. Now it's not a total. You got a total eclipse there in San Francisco for your lunar eclipse. We are only going to have a partial eclipse here in Berlin. And the, we're gonna show that to you now. And this is going to be coming up here in uh, 12 days, I believe it is now. It is on June 10th. And here in Berlin, the uh, maximum part of the eclipse, where you will have the major the, the most part of the sun covered as possible for this eclipse, that will happen at 1238 and 45 seconds PM. And, and normally I'm not so precise about times like that throwing in the seconds but uh with solar eclipses that's very important particularly if it's a total eclipse so as we look at this eclipse here and we can see it's starting um the moon appears to move across the sun so in this partial we're only going to have what looks like a little bite taken out of the sun and I want to make it very, 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 very clear because this is so important for safety. Never, ever, ever look directly at the sun with your own eyes or through a telescope that is not made to look at the sun. You can very badly damage your eyes permanently. There are safe ways to observe beautiful events like solar eclipses, even partials. Um, you can... Uh, find out from your local planetarium or astronomy club if they're doing a viewing party and we can help you out. You can order specialty eclipse glasses. Now I wanna make it very clear, these are not sunglasses. You do mm -hmm. not wanna watch an eclipse through sunglasses. They will not protect your eyes. They are not meant to protect you from staring directly at the sun. So you wanna get these very special solar eclipse glasses that are made for solar viewing. Uh, also, they will protect your cell phone if you're trying to take pictures of it. You can fry the optics in your phone trying to take pictures of the sun. So uh, I would recommend getting a pair for yourself. And if you really want to take pictures with your phone, get a pair of eclipse glasses to put over your camera on your phone as well. Uh, and eclipse glasses, all that you will see is the sun. Now, if you can't get your hands on those, you can make a pinhole viewer. And pinhole viewers, we're going to zoom out and take a look at that eclipse again from space. Pinhole viewers uh, are super easy to make. Uh, you can get a um, tube, for example, like a cardboard tube from uh, toilet paper, paper towels, a poster tube. You take some aluminum foil, put it over one end, leave the other end open, poke a hole in it, 
and then align that with the sun without looking at the sun. This is very important. Hold a white card under it and it'll project the image of the eclipse onto that card for you. You don't even need that. If you have a colander or a strainer or something like that in your kitchen, literally all you have to do is grab that, go outside and hold it over the sidewalk and it'll produce a bunch of little projections of the eclipse all over the sidewalk. Yeah, that so was really we cool have... during the the total solar eclipse that was a few years ago. Uh, yes. Even the tree, I was seeing so many pictures of the shadows through the trees. People could see the eclipse yes. happening, which is very cool. It was super cool. Yeah, you can even use nature to help you see the eclipse without looking at the sun. So there's, mm -hmm. there's lots of ways to observe safely. And I highly recommend you do it because even partial eclipses are super fun to watch. Super cool. Uh, so we're going to take a look at the syzygy here in space that gives us our partial eclipse. And right now you probably are wondering, where is the moon? I see the sun. I see the earth. Where's the moon? The moon is mm -hmm. in the new moon phase. So we have to show you with a circle around where it is because for us, we don't see it. It's in shadow to us at the moment. Um, the sunlight is coming from behind. So what you're seeing now with this line is... Um, where on the earth the eclipse is visible, where it's hitting on the earth. So uh, moving slightly there, showing how that, that line, that path of the eclipse is moving across the earth. So that's visible here in Berlin um, and I believe Northern parts of Canada as well. Mm. I believe it's visible in Ontario, for example, but um, unfortunately won't be coming to you at this point in time, Mary. Indeed. Yeah. Can't but, wait them on. No, unfortunately, but that's okay. We'll get there. So again, uh, for those of you here in Berlin, uh, the eclipse at its maximum will be at 1238 PM. Uh, it begins though at 1136 and it ends at uh, 143 PM. So uh, if you want to sit there and watch the whole thing, I know I'll be doing that as long as it's not cloudy, <laughs> then uh, yeah, definitely definitely worth hanging out and watching that for a couple hours. So maybe if you're still doing work from home, pull your computer to somewhere where you can work and enjoy the eclipse at the same time. <laughs> so, and just, just kind of to recap too, cause I know it can be a little, sorry, wanted to go back real quick to the safety. I, mm -hmm. This is something really important to me after having worked with the total solar eclipse in 2017. Uh, protecting people's eyes is very important to me. <laughs> so um, on the, the left, the image you're seeing is a telescope that has been modified to safely observe an eclipse. Uh, that is a special filter over the top of it. And then uh, that's actually the same material that is in the eclipse glasses, which you see on the right. And the eclipse glasses will have two markings inside. They'll have an, an ISO marking and they will have a, a CE marking. And then they'll have numbers after both of those. And that will tell you that they are uh, correct, properly made, not counterfeit eclipse glasses. And if you're thinking counterfeit eclipse glasses, that is 100% a thing. Uh, that was unfortunately an issue back in 2017. So um, always double check and you can check your eclipse glasses to make sure they're safe too by while you're still inside, hold them up to a, a lamp in your home and see if you can see light passing through them. And if you see scratches, pinholes, or if you can easily see through them, those are not real eclipse glasses, do not use them, or they've been damaged, do not use them, get a new pair. So that's what those look like. And, and now I was getting ahead of myself. Uh, we can just recap a little bit of the difference between the lunar and the solar eclipses, because we've thrown a lot of syzygies at you now and make it a little easier just to, to remember which is which. Mm -hmm. So the solar eclipse, the moon comes between the earth and the sun. And with the lunar eclipse, the earth goes between the sun and the moon. Um, so you'll always have a full moon for a lunar eclipse. You will always have a new moon for a solar eclipse. And if the sun is ever in between the earth and the moon, that is no longer an eclipse, that is an apocalypse. And so again, something is very wrong, yes. <laughs> Bigger things to worry about than eclipse glasses at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so now we will have some total uh, solar eclipses coming up. We'll also have lunar eclipses coming up, which is what I almost just said. Uh, we will also have some total solar eclipses coming up as well that uh, we will be able to see both in North America and Europe. So the next one for North America is April 8th, 
2024. So you're seeing the path now, the, the red is the path of totality. And then the really dark red part is um, where there's like the longest amount of like that's the center line of totality. You'll get the most amount of totality, the longest amount of totality there. And for this one in particular, Mexico has the longest point. This is a much, if you saw the 2017 total eclipse, that one, its maximum point was under uh, three minutes. But this one is around five minutes long for totality. Ooh, so okay. it is, yeah, it's a lot of totality. And, you know, it, it's so cool. The temperature can drop like 10, 20 degrees, um, crickets will start chirping, birds will start singing night songs, dogs will start settling down to go to sleep. Um, and then, of course, the biggest part of nature that you will experience are humans. Because even humans that I've been around who haven't been excited about an eclipse, when it hits totality, everybody starts cheering and hooping and hollering. And it is really something... And in 2024, we should be able to be around people again safely in crowds. And I do highly endorse doing that together. Mm -hmm. It's always fun to share astronomy with friends anyway. So yeah, absolutely. I'm hoping to go to the 2024 one. That seems amazing. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but if you cannot make it to the United States or Mexico or Canada for that matter, uh, in 2024, in 2027, on August 2nd, we will be having a total solar eclipse come through Africa and the southernmost part of Europe. So you're going to have to go to Spain for that one uh, if you're staying in Europe. Otherwise, you can go through northern Africa and uh, over into the Middle East. And this one will be definitely more accessible for people here in uh, Europe. Now, I might be a little biased. I would say go to both. <laughs> you can never get enough eclipses. I'm already excited for the next one. And I'm still have fond memories of the last one. So definitely worth trying to go to both. Start booking your hotels and making your travel arrangements now. I'm not joking. Mm -hmm. Make them really far out because the closer you get, everything will be booked up, even camping sites. So this is something that people really do travel for. So if it's something you want to do, and again, definitely recommend it, start booking and planning now. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I think it's clear we could talk about eclipses all day, <laughs> but I'm sure people at home would probably like to see more than just things that affect the earth. Now, I guess we are still going to stay a little bit on topic about the eclipse, mm -hmm. but yeah, because we're going to move out into the solar system, right? Yeah. So yeah, just won't be earthly. Exactly. Yeah, because we were talking about what we would want to visit outside of the Earth during this presentation as well. And something that I find super fun is that Earth is not the only place that has eclipses. There's actually uh, another place where we have documented that there have been eclipses as well, which is Mars, the, the next rocky planet out from the sun um, and a place that people are often very interested in. We have a lot of missions that we've sent to Mars and whatnot. Uh, but here you're seeing that Mars has two moons. So you see those two orbits there. It has two moons called Phobos and Deimos. So since there are three objects possible to line up here, we can have a CCG here as well. So uh, I, the Curiosity rover is on Mars right now, and it was able to capture some pictures of a few uh, solar eclipses that Mars had. And I believe we have a picture of the one that was made by Phobos, the bigger of the two moons. But since Phobos and Deimos, they're not uh, nice, round, big moons like our moon. Uh, they're kind of small and they're more potato-y shaped or like asteroid shaped kind of. Uh, and so you get very funny looking eclipses, in my opinion. So this uh, solar eclipse, you can see Phobos going in front of the sun and it looks kind of like googly eyes because not a perfect round shape and it has this kind of funny <laughs> thing and unfortunately yes. for mars mars will never have a total solar eclipse because phobos and deimos are not big enough in the martian sky to block out the sun entirely like the moon is able to for our sky yeah still looks very cool though it definitely does uh it, it's so cool too that they were able to get curiosity to get that image and mm -hmm. i'm really excited too to see um when the next one comes around, if Curiosity and Perseverance are both still functioning, oh yeah, how are their how might their images compare? Especially now that I feel kind of 
I know curiosity isn't alive, but I feel kind of bad for it because I feel like it kind of got forgotten in the wake of perseverance, but it's still doing very real and important science on Mars and deserves mm -hmm. recognition. But um, obviously the technology on perseverance is newer. So I'm curious how big of a difference that's going to make and just what they'd be able to study using both of the rovers because they both have different instruments on them yeah. that can allow for different kinds of uh, scientific studies. So that would be very, very interesting to see. And hopefully, hopefully NASA will make that happen. So yeah, especially, watching NASA. yeah, especially because Perseverance and Curiosity are quite far apart on Mars too. So they could compare what they're seeing from their different locations on Mars as well. Yes, definitely. Well, Mary, I know you were excited to go to Mars, but since I'm here in Berlin, I need us to go to Neptune. <laughs> and that is because Neptune is our Berlin connection. We are very proud of the fact that Neptune was discovered here in Berlin. So, um, and that was, that was uh, quite a while ago, obviously, um, well before our lifetime. So uh, first of all, there was uh, an astronomer um, who through mathematical calculations predicted that this planet existed. Uh, and that was Urban Heverier. And he made these calculations saying, I think there's a planet here. I just don't have the technology to see it, but this is where my math says it should be. And so then later comes along Johann Galle, and he was the Berlin-based astronomer who took Leverrier's mathematical equations and used them to help him find Neptune. So Neptune, is a little piece of little piece of Berlin, or I guess Berlin Berlin could call it its sister planet, I suppose, <laughs> since since there's no cities on Neptune since it's a gas giant. Um, yeah. or, so and and Neptune is is quite large, especially in comparison to the Earth. So uh, I love this comparison because it really helps you kind of visualize. Um, if Earth was the size of a nickel or a five cent euro piece, so the same size. Um, <clears throat> then Neptune would be the size of a basketball. Whoa. Yeah, so that, that really puts into perspective just how big Neptune is. Um, and it is uh, about 2.8 billion miles or 4.5 billion kilometers. I'm working on learning metric, I promise. Um, as an American, that is, <laughs> that's one of the things I'm working on being, a, being an immigrant to, to a metric using country. Um, but yes, so it is, uh, 4.5 billion kilometers or 2.8 billion miles from the earth. And, uh, to put that into, or excuse me, from the sun, I apologize, uh, a little bit closer to the earth, just not much. Um, but yes, so from the sun and to put that into perspective, that means it takes sunlight about four hours to travel to Neptune from the sun. So, uh, high noon on Neptune, were it to have a solid surface that you could stand on if you were standing there um, at high noon, it would look like dim twilight to us. So a while after the sunset before it gets completely dark. So that is noon on Neptune, a very, very dark noon. <laughs> and um, another thing about this planet too is that it's named after the Roman god of the sea. So most of the planets all of the planets actually, it's the, some of the dwarf planets have other names, but uh, all of the, the eight planets are named after um, Roman gods and goddesses. And so uh, Neptune is the Roman god of the sea. And that is who King Triton is based on, for example, the Little Mermaid. Um, that is the and... reference I use personally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, its moons are actually named for various lesser sea gods and nymphs that are in Greek mythology. So while there are differences in Greek and Roman mythology, they're still very similar and intertwined in a lot of ways. And so you'll see within astronomy, in Western culture at least, there's a lot of mixing of both the Roman and Greek names. So um, for example, with Jupiter, uh, Jupiter's the Roman name and Zeus would be the Greek name. So um a day on neptune is 16 hours long so 
Hmm. If you feel you don't have enough hours in the day here on Earth, you don't want to go to Neptune because uh, you really won't have enough there. And one year is 165 Earth years. So if you want to feel young for a long time and uh, have very really stretch day. out between your birthdays, then maybe Neptune is the place you want to be. Uh, it's also the densest of our four gas giant planets, but it has the same makeup as Uranus. So it's about 80% fluid, hot, dense, icy materials like water, methane, and ammonia. And then uh, this is above a small rocky core, but it's just this beautiful swirling mix of gases covering that small rocky core. Um, and that's why it doesn't have a solid surface. Now, we are at the edge of our solar system, at least when it comes to our planets. And, and one of the things, too, I, I will point out before we move on, too, is that you can actually see uh, not only some of the moons here of Neptune, but also its rings. So a lot of people forget that all of the gas giants have rings because we focus on Saturn. Saturn has the biggest, brightest, easiest to spot with a telescope from our own backyards. But Jupiter, Neptune, and Uranus also all do have rings as well. And Neptune actually has at least five main rings with four prominent ring arcs, which is actually pretty cool. Um, and hopefully, I'm hoping in the future we'll have some probes go check out Neptune a little more in depth. Um, and while I am a, a transplant to Berlin, uh, I have I've come to love Neptune like a native Berliner. So I'd like to I'd like to see more studies done on it. Yeah, but it's uh, fascinating for me too because of that fact. Like, I feel like when I talk about Neptune and Uranus, I'm like, I don't have much to say. We haven't studied them in a while, <laughs> so it's like, right? Nice it's like, oh, something flew by on the way to something else. Yeah, and indeed. we got a little bit of info about it. Yeah, yeah. so definitely would be nice to know a, a little bit more. But uh, yeah, like I said, we are at the edge of our solar system, at least when it comes to the planets. We have some dwarf planets, of course, along the way, but we're gonna we're gonna skip those this time because mm -hmm. that could be a whole nother show in and of itself. Um, and we are going to go ahead now and head outside of our galaxy to see a very realistic looking model of the Milky Way galaxy. So that is our home galaxy. This is what um, we believe through studies the galaxy looks like. At this point in time, we have not yet had any spacecraft exit our galaxy to to send us a picture of it yet and we we probably won't within our lifetimes unless we come up with a really fantastic new technology that we haven't discovered yet um but by studying other galaxies and knowing how uh, a lot of things in our galaxy function we're able to come up with a, a pretty good realistic looking model so uh the milky way is a spiral galaxy as you can see here it looks like a lovely spiral. Uh, and at the center, we have a black hole. Mm -hmm. So uh, definitely lovely. All the stars that we see in our night sky are a part of our Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way galaxy is actually part of something called the local group, which is in the Virgo cluster. So that's kind of like our neighborhood in the solar system. So we're actually going to go out even a little bit further. And we'll, we'll show you that neighborhood. So, yeah. Just wanted it's, to note too, the black hole is not something you can see in that in that model. Just FYI. <laughs> no, no. Um, not not in this particular model. No. And and the the image of the black hole that we got. Um, gosh, that was a couple years ago now, wasn't it? Um, that was really twenty nineteen. Yeah, mm -hmm. feels like a completely different time in our lives. Um, that that is actually not of our galaxy either because we have no way to take a picture of our galaxy yet um, so that is of a different galaxy's black hole mm -hmm. still super impressive extremely impressive um and uh rather the i guess the event horizon but uh here you see inside that box is the local group and i actually kind of love this box because for those of you who uh went to planetariums in the 80s and 90s and remember the original digistar digistar 2 uh very much reminds me of the the green vector 
drawings that we would get from the Digistar onto the planetarium dome and it, it warms my heart. So uh, I love my little green, green box here uh, showing our local group. And like I said, that's part of the Virgo cluster. So you may have heard people talk about our galactic or celestial or universal address. So you would say, for example, uh, right now I am standing in the Zeiss Schools Planetarium in Berlin. So that is Prenzlauer de Axis, um, 80. I'm so used to saying it in German. Uh, and then our zip code, Berlin, Germany. Suppose you could go as far as to say Europe, Earth, the solar system, the Milky Way galaxy, the local group of the Virgo cluster, of the universe. So that would be your full extra long address if you wanted to be very specific as to where you were. And this isn't as far as we can go. We can actually keep going. So we're gonna head out even further. Um, mm -hmm. And on the way there, these are the brightest galaxies around our local group. Um, and yeah, even, even the pinpoints that you're looking at, remember those are not stars, those are all galaxies with all their own stars in them, which is just mind boggling, boggling to yeah. think about really, just yeah. the sheer expanse of it. It's a lot to take in. It really is. <laughs> but if you think that's a lot to take in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go all the way out as far as we can possibly see and I do always like to point out when we're going out this far into the universe, we're also time traveling in a way because this light, we see all of this because of uh, light that comes to us, goes into our telescopes and that's how we see these objects. So this is a map based on what we see. And because it takes so long for the light of these objects to get to us, all this here, this is looking back in time billions of years. So this is not what these galaxies look like right now. This is what they would have looked like several billion years ago. And because that's all from our perspective, you also get this kind of weird uh, shape that the galaxies seem to form right here. So you see these gaps on the top and bottom, not actually the shape of the universe, though I always say it would be delightful if the universe looked like a butterfly, but unfortunately it does not. It's because of our perspective and things blocking our view. And because of that, we can only take you so far. We can only take you to the edge of what we can see in our universe which is the cosmic microwave background, which you're seeing on the screen in the background there. And uh, my favorite way to describe this is that if you walk outside tonight and it's a clear night and you look up at the night sky, you are not going to see this everywhere you look in the sky like we're seeing it on the planetarium. I'm grateful for that, that would look weird. But if you could see with microwave light, which is a lower energy form of light that our eyes can't see, but our telescopes can, you would see this every single place you look in the sky. So this is the earliest light of the universe, a few hundred thousand years after when the Big Bang would have happened. Uh, and I like to refer to it as the baby picture of our universe, since this is the earliest light we can see roughly 13 and a half billion years ago is uh, where this light came, came from. Uh, it's so cool to be able to fly out here. <laughs> it really is. Oh, if only our eyes, it would be cool too if we could just switch our eyes like we can switch the instruments that we use mm -hmm. to observe these things and just switch yeah. to the different the different wavelengths just within our own eyes. Maybe one day technology will get to that point. Yeah, it'd be cool. Some uh, fancy robot glasses that we'll have in the future or something. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, unfortunately, we're starting to run out of time. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to fly back to the Earth now. And fortunately, we can fly quick through, quickly through time and space to do that within the planetarium. Mm -hmm. And while we're flying back, um, shout out to our friends in Chicago and uh, the Adler Planetarium. Uh, for the 2024 eclipse, they're going to have 93% uh, totality. So mm. if something happens, you aren't able to make it to totality down in like Texas or Mexico or along that path. Um, I know it goes through Carbondale, Illinois. To totality goes through there. It just skirts outside of St. Louis this time. Um, Chicago has a really good 93% totality as well. So if you if you are in that area, definitely check that out. Uh, Detroit's not far from Chicago, a shout out to the Michigan Science Center folks. Uh, they definitely will be able to help you out too. And, and even uh, over in Pennsylvania and Carnegie uh, Science Center, the, they will uh, be able to 
uh, give you great tips on that as well. So if you're out in Pennsylvania, definitely, definitely hit them up too. So really just honestly, anywhere, if you have a local planetarium, if you're not in Berlin or San Francisco, find your local planetarium and talk to them about it. And they will be more than happy to help you. I am, I mm. am absolutely sure of it because that's why we do this. We, lo we love talking to people about science and astronomy. So real quick, I just want to throw out again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, Mary and I would love to talk to you, answer your burning questions, um, say hi, <laughs> go, go ahead and, and shoot them out there. No question too crazy. Um, remember, there are no dumb questions. So uh, if you're nervous about asking, don't worry about it. We're happy to happy to take your questions and answer them for you. So, mm -hmm. so right now we're, we're getting shadow because the sunlight's coming from behind. And as we see, we're coming up on a night here and the sun coming out from around the back there of our beautiful planet. And whether it's a night view from space or a daytime view from space, one of the things I will never get tired of looking at our planet from space is just how cohesive and connected it is. And, and also how small and fragile it is. So this is something I know, uh, I believe it's called the astronaut effect. So mm -hmm. once an astronaut goes up into space and they see Earth from space and they see there are no borders that are visible from space, that's, that's a man-made thing. If there, uh, there, there is no uh, way to, to see the division between countries, it's just one planet with all of us on it. We are not alone. We're all together in this. And our fragile blue marble is something for us to care for and take care of. And, you know, as Mary and I know, we haven't been able to, to see each other in person, unfortunately, since 2019, but we're still able to keep in touch with each other. There's ways to observe the sky together, even if it's digitally. Um, that is one cool thing that the <laughs> one silver lining of the pandemic is that I think it's made us more connected in the times we can't be together than we ever were before or thought about being before. And I know, mm -hmm. It's been very sad not being connected to you, our visitors. Um, and I'm sure you feel the same way, Mary, and everybody else at, at the Morrison Planetarium. But it is wonderful to be able to connect to you in your home still, even, even during these, these, I'm going to say it, unprecedented times. <laughs> so... But once again, uh, I, I do want to reiterate that we're very excited. We will be opening soon. Our case numbers have fallen below the required threshold here in Berlin. So uh, keep an eye out on the Stiftung Planetarium Berlin's website, and we will let you know when we will be reopening. Come see our shows. Come visit us. Come talk to us. Just come say hi. Uh, we really are looking forward to seeing you all in person again. And... Um, Mary, I, I know you guys just reopened recently. Yeah, we opened uh, just a few weeks ago. We're still at limited capacity right now, but I'm sure that'll shift and change over the coming weeks and months. Um, and if you check out Morrison Planetarium, we have a Facebook page as well, where we'll post uh, different things that we're doing. And right now uh, we do still have one live stream that we do regularly. So on Wednesdays at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, the show that we're doing in the planetarium, we're also live streaming out to YouTube and to Facebook. Uh, so if you want to see our shows, but you can't be in the Bay Area physically, you can still uh, watch our shows online uh, for the time being. And as of right now, at least I'm the one that gives those shows. So you'll hear my voice if you want to uh, watch those on Wednesday. <laughs> Definitely, definitely worth your while. And I believe that uh, San Francisco is nine hours behind Berlin. So I believe that's 1 a.m. for us. So if you are a night owl like me, you can uh, join me in checking out Mary's live streams on Wednesdays. So, And I think they stick around on the YouTube pages and the Facebook pages, too, if you want to watch the recording of it or something. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. For those for those who are, are morning birds instead, check it out when you wake up in the morning. But mm -hmm. um yeah, that has definitely been one of the fun things that these live streams have enabled us to do is to to work with our colleagues around the world and and still reach out and do do astronomy and enjoy space science. So mm -hmm. with that, it looks like we have no further questions. So yeah. we're going to wrap it up and uh, 
Mary, thank you again so much for joining us. And I hope you have a, a great rest of your, your day. Your day is just beginning. <laughs> thank so. you. I'm, I'm so glad to uh, be here. And this was super fun. And yeah, I hope you have a good rest of your evening. <laughs> thank you very much. So, and to all of you at home, wherever you may be in the world, thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, my name's Anna Green, and it has been a fun time. I hope you enjoyed yourselves as well. And we look forward to seeing you hopefully very soon in person. Have a great evening. And please, as always, stay healthy, stay safe. Mm -hmm.